What ends up happening is you decide, I'm just going to go out, I'm going to hire them, because California has a law that talks about shared fences and talks about it being shared responsibility. You happen to be a lawyer, so why don't you educate us on that? Well, that, that's right. California has a law called the Good Neighbor Law. This is the plaintiff, Constantine. He says the defendants are his neighbors, and they share a 72-foot-long, 6-foot-high fence between their properties. Unfortunately, the fence blew down. They agreed to split the costs, and then at the last minute, when the fence guy was ready to start the job, they canceled. He had to pay the entire cost of the fence, and is now suing his backtracking neighbors for the $1,550 they owe him. These are the defendants, Patricia and Terrence. Patricia says they never agreed to the plaintiff's terms or to the contractor for the job because they wanted a detailed proposal and never got one. Turns out, the guy he used was just a handyman. He didn't use redwood and he left a gap at the base of the fence. Now he wants them to pay for half of this shoddy job? No way. They're accused of refusing to be fenced in. All parties, please use your right hand. What you are about to witness is real. The participants are not actors. They are actual litigants with a case pending in civil court. Both parties have agreed to drop their claims and have their cases settled here before Judge Marilyn Millian in our forum, the People's Court. The People's Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Marilyn Millian is now presiding. Litigants have been sworn, Your Honor. Thank you, Douglas. You're welcome, man. Okay. Mr. Constantine, you and Mr. Terrence and Ms. Patricia share a fence, correct? Correct. And at some time in 2016, uh, a 25-foot portion of the fence blows down, and everybody agrees that they're going to repair it. And what ends up happening? Uh, estimates go back and forth, uh, really, between the contractor that we, uh, we agreed to go forward with. And uh, and the defendants, they uh, kept asking for revisions to the proposal. Uh, they asked for revision after revision uh, over a period of several months. Uh, it during that time, uh, I ended up moving out of the house with my family, and ended up having uh, some tenants that were going to move in. So I gave notice to the defendants that we've got some tenants that are going to be moving in. Um, we really need to make a final decision. And let's talk about what the revisions were. Tell me about it. What kinds of things were they there asking were things, or, for to be revised? So uh, originally, uh, we the, when the fence when the fence fell over, uh, we had agreed on a, a standard fence and just replace it as is. Uh, then after that, the defendants uh, explained they wanted a slightly sturdier fence, so they wouldn't have to revisit this issue in the future. And I agreed to that. So that was one revision. Uh, another revision that they wanted were a different style of fence. Uh, they requested things like uh, the cost of all of the materials uh, for the estimate. So they wanted a more detailed estimate. Uh, that's that was the reoccurring uh, the reoccurring theme that happened. So what do you think was the last straw on that particular company? You had them ready to go, and the, like the next day, and the and these folks said, no, 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 no. We still got more things we want to revise. We're almost there. And what happened? The fence was ready to go and the contractor was ready, but the defendants wanted more details, like they wanted the cost of nails, price of boards and everything on the fence. So what ends up happening with that contractor? He came back and spoke with the defendants directly uh, at least at least one more time and gave another at least one or two more revisions after that. Uh, and I then asked, he got sick of it. Kind of the final straw for that contractor was uh, the defendants got a separate contractor to come in and got a quote from, from I believe it was their friend, to, to do work on the fence. And at that point, the contractor that we'd selected and we've been working with for several months said, I, this isn't the job for me, and withdrew. OK. And so now it's time to find a different contractor. So what happens? They said, you know, you said that they had their contractor who they liked. What was wrong with him? Why didn't you, uh, everybody end up going with him? Uh, well, I said I said that's fine. Uh, I'm happy to go with uh, with this guy. I, I just want to get a proposal from him. And on top of that, I, I found out that he wasn't licensed. And so at that okay. point, I said I I can't go with this guy. 
So you end up, at this point, you're totally in a crunch. You have tenants coming in. You don't want to have construction while your tenants are there. That's not part of the deal. That's going to cost you to lose money because the tenants aren't going to put up with that. But in any event, what ends up happening is you decide, I'm just going to go out. I'm going to hire them because California has a law that talks about shared fences and talks about it being shared responsibility. You happen to be a lawyer, so why don't you educate us on that? Well, that, that's right. California has a law called the Good Neighbor Law. Uh, it's... Um... California Civil Code 841. Uh, you can look it up and it says that neighbors are required to share fence costs. And um, uh, I, had, I had mentioned this to the defendants in the past and everyone had agreed that we were gonna share the cost of, fence, uh, of this fence. So let me this talk to you guys, Mr. Terrence and Ms. Patricia. What went so wrong that you decided not to pay a mishap? He ends up hiring somebody. So you tell me your version of this. Why is it that it would not be fair under the California statute to say, hey, the fence benefits both of you. It's on your property line. He wants you to pay him your half. He paid for the whole thing. He wants you to pay him your half. You tell me why that's not reasonable. What we agreed upon and what was built ended up being two different things. We got estimates, we submitted two estimates in 2017, and we did not get a How much response. were the estimates? I want to say there were 3,800, something like that. Um, it was for Conhart Redwood, which is a high-grade redwood. Uh, just basically high-quality uh, materials. So we want this fence to last for over 10 years. Okay, I've read the text back and forth and the emails back and forth, and you guys seemed really persnickety, which is your right, it's your property. But it doesn't matter what was revised, then you came up with more things to revise. Why was that? Why couldn't you all just come to terms with the contractor everybody had been happy with and get the job done already? What was the problem? All we were asking for was just everything itemized, but he never itemized that. That's the only you know sticking point. And everything. Yeah, but you didn't. You asked for that after the third revision. <clears throat> you didn't ask for that from the beginning. You asked for that after the guy had invested all this time. In any event, you end up putting it up because you had, as you had warned several times, you had tenants coming in. When you put it up, the 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 quote is thirty one hundred. Uh, it ends up being a little more than that, and then you folks have paid zero. Not I don't want to pay half. It's I don't want to pay a penny. Tell me why you think it's appropriate that you not have to pay a penny. Because the law also allows a judge, in the absence of an agreement, to take certain factors into consideration and then to decide, should they pay half, should they pay a quarter, should they pay zero. So you tell me, persuade me why it is that you should not have to pay half. Well, we were on board with the agreed upon contractor. On the night of the 27th, we got a text that he had conflicted out. We yeah, let me tell you what happened in case you don't understand what that means. He got sick of you guys. I'm going to speak to you in plain language. He got sick of you guys and your demands. He doesn't want to tell you how much he pays per nail. He says, this isn't the job for me. The problem is the plaintiff is super polite, and he doesn't want to just come out and say that, like most of my litigants. But I'm going to tell you, that is exactly what happened. So it's not his fault that the agreed-upon contractor didn't do the job because the agreed-upon contractor had now done four or five revisions. We move on from that, and now tell me, what about this fence? is unacceptable to you that you should not have to share 50% of the cost. We agreed upon high grade lumber. That's not what was used. You wanted a certain type of redwood and a different type of redwood was used. Is that what you're saying? Yes, there's different grades of lumber. So we requested a grade A lumber, which is a Conhart lumber. We were looking at building for longevity. I got it. And what kind of lumber was used? Low grade lumber. What kind of, okay, you're saying that, but can you tell me, uh, all right, you tell me, uh, Mr. Constantine, what kind of lumber was used? Show me the receipt. They provided a proposal that had just redwood, redwood boards. Just said redwood. I don't know what grade it was. No. Uh, I just wanted a yeah. standard fence. Just and redwood. do you have any evidence that it was a lower grade than you had agreed to? What evidence do you have that it was a low grade? Your eyeballs, like you just feel it's lower or... Do you, what evidence do you have that it's a low-grade redwood instead of the high-grade redwood you'd agreed to? Because I reached out to a lumber company because I wanted to know what type of lumber it was. Do you have any evidence that it is a low-grade redwood? No. Okay. Now, in addition to that, what else was wrong with it? It wasn't board on board, which is what you wanted, right? That's correct. We wanted but to build it was a, a fence that matched the other, the rest of the fence. Correct, Mr. Constantine? That's correct. 
So we had agreed on board on board, but it's significantly more expensive. So originally okay. I had agreed, yeah, so I'll go with board on board if we can get the fence done. Oh, I the guess then we shouldn't have made cost. them angry. Okay. So now here you are. You're going to have to shoulder the entire cost because they're not cooperating. So you end up just going with whatever else was around your house and you are objecting to it. And I understand it's not what you had agreed to. I get it. What else was wrong with it? The biggest concern is about the concrete. Our properties are 100% in sand. So I was very clear that the concrete was to be mixed outside of the post hole. Um, the reason being is that when water is poured in, the sand will soak up the water versus the product. So that in You know a lot about a this safety. stuff. I, you should have just found somebody that he agreed to. He wanted to do the fence. How do you know, by the way, that this contractor didn't mix it outside? I submitted photographs that show the laborers with the bag of that creek concrete being shook into the hole and then holding a five gallon white bucket full of water and pouring it into the hole. Okay, there's a million pictures. Can you, oh, here we go. There. There we go. <clears throat> the last three. Yeah, we are doing that. Well, you get what you paid for, right? So here we are, and now here is what I am left with. Oh, by the way, I don't, I don't want to cut you off. Is there any other objection that you have? We agreed to a six foot completion of a fence. There was a tree in the backyard and the fence was built over the tree, which added to the height. So the finish height of the fence is 15 inches above code. Have you let code enforcement know that? We have a shared fence. I have not. Um, anything else? There is an unusual gap in the middle of the fence where it goes from smooth on 50% of it and rough on the other 50%. The concern is that somebody could potentially get caught in this unusual gap in the top of the fence. Okay. Why, why did they do this? Do you see this picture, Mr. Constantine? I do. What happened there? What, 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 why is the reason they did it? I tried to make it as fair as possible to have half the fence face my yard and half the fence face my uh, my neighbor's yard. They're identical fences. It's just oh. the, the cross members are on one side for half the fence and the other side for the half the fence. So it's essentially an identical fence. But does that create end up creating a gap in the fence? It does create a small gap that's the width of a two by four. Um, and that's a pretty big gap. I, I, I just don't understand. I mean, I guess you're saying you wanted it to be fair half and half, but to me, it looks worse that way. And apparently to them, it looks worse that way too. All right, guys. This is one of those instances where California law makes sense to me, um, which often isn't the case. But they're very reasonable. They say, look, we want the parties to agree on a shared fence. But if they don't, and one party decides to do it, they have to do certain things. And if they do, then they get to talk, you know, they get to ask a court of law to say, OK, you have to share in the expense. In this case, I have parties that are all completely on notice of the desire to do a fence, what kind of fence, everybody's working towards it, and in seven stinking months, it doesn't get done. And he got sick of waiting, so he went ahead and did it. I am going to take into consideration that when he went ahead and did it, he didn't do board on board. I don't think you have proof that they used an inferior redwood. You got zero proof of that. According to you, he did it too high. I don't know if he did or not. According to you, they mixed it wrong, and it, I think you're probably right on that. I am looking at you know, your issues that I know, because I see the text, I see the emails, I see your demands. Some of your demands are reasonable, and some of your demands maybe just really aren't. It doesn't end up being what you had agreed to, which is board on board, but it is Redwood, and it is a fence. And the suggestion that you should pay zero is ludicrous, OK? Now. What California law says a court should consider when they're deciding how to apportion the cost of the fence and whether it's fair to ask someone to pay half is whether it's a terrible financial burden for you. I find that it isn't. Whether the cost of the fence would exceed the difference in value of the property for you. In other words, did he go out and get a you know $12,000 gilded fence that doesn't add that much to your property? I don't think that's the case here whether the fence is more valuable to him than it is to you. And I think you got something there in your complaints about, 
well, why, you know, maybe he doesn't care, but maybe you have a pet or you want a pet, or now all of a sudden, you know, it's a problem if it's a tiny, tiny pet. The reasonableness of the particular construction or maintenance project, you've got to complain on the concrete. I got to tell you, I come from a long line of construction, and lots of people will do it that way. I agree with you. I don't think it's the best practice because of exactly what you said, the water gets, you know, that's not how you should do it. Whether it's a, just an unnecessary fence, well, that's certainly not the case. You wanted the fence. And anything else that I feel like considering, okay? And I'll tell you what else I feel like considering. He was very patient. He tried. There were a million revisions on contracts. You, you know, the, the contractors kept doing them for you. Uh, you still weren't satisfied. It really kind of looked like you just didn't want to go forward with it. So he got frustrated and he ended up doing it. Those are all factors that I'm going to take into consideration. He's asking you for $1,550, and I'm going to order you to pay $1,033, which ends up being your third of the fence. That is my verdict. Good luck, folks. And of course, your court costs. Thank you. So the plaintiff is finally going to get some money from the defendants. Let me talk to the defendants, Patricia and Terrence. You know, it's interesting. The judge referred to you. She thought you were persnickety. Just to double check, I looked it up. It means someone who is fussy about small details. That kind of hit the nail on the head with you guys. What do you think about her decision? Well, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't hurt to be persnickety, right? You, everything wants to be detailed, but we do want a long, you know, something that has longevity. And I have a feeling we're going to be at this again in the next five years. Well, you're going to have to give the uh, the plaintiff a thousand dollars at least, thousand thirty three, I think it is. Uh, that's the judge's verdict. You're going to have to live with it. You okay with that? Well, as she says we have to pay. We have to pay. Yes, you do. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Constantine. Let me ask you, how do you feel? Finally, this has been a long battle for you, hasn't it? Been looking for closure. This is closure. And does this do it for you? You okay with that? You know, all along, um, I, I haven't wanted to do anything to upset my neighbors. I, I, I had a good relationship with uh, with my neighbors in the past, and I hope we can put this behind us and uh, and uh, move forward as, as a good neighbors again. Okay, very good. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, let's uh, have another session now of After the Verdict. Here are the judges. Wow. Quite a bit of back and forth here over the construction of this fence. I mean... Um, I'm watching the revisions back and forth, half a dozen revisions. They had proposals years ago for this, and it was a long road to get it done. I think probably in, in this neighborhood, you probably could have gotten a nuclear power plant permitted <laughs> faster than it took these guys to get the fence squared away. Yeah, it was Did you get that impression? Time. Yeah, it was quite a bit of time. And certainly this Good Neighbors Law, or Good Neighbor Act that they have in California that governs commonly shared fences like this, uh, is in a sense intended to act as a shield to protect one neighbor from kind of just being taken advantage of or, or bullied or overpowered by the other neighbor. But sometimes when you have a statute that can act as a shield, you can use it as a sword too at the other party yeah. by asking about things like, well, how many nails are they going to use? I, we, uh, I want to know the price he's paying per pound for nails. Right. It was w one of the last requests. And it's funny because I'm sure there's a lot of people within the sound of our voice who are saying, what? He wants to put up a fence, I gotta pay part of it. Right. Um, and thinking it's nutty, but I, I actually kind of think it's it's a really good policy. Right. And, and I shouldn't be I shouldn't be too hard on the defendants because hey, they were just watching, they were trying to make sure they got a quality fence built uh, at the end of the they day. They were so. they were moving at a glacial pace. They and, sure um, were. I was trying to do the math in my head. I'm thinking maybe two six penny nails on each post at the top and maybe wherever the rails are. I was trying to do the count in my head and I, I got to the, a couple hundred. The plaintiff was so polite too. He conflicted out. You know, he was trying not to say, yeah, he made, they made him crazy, you know, right. which is exactly what happened. Well, hopefully going forward, these people get along. It sounds yeah, like well, it. They're, they're all reason, they all seem like nice people. Yeah. But boy, Mr. Constantine had the patient. Constantine has he the really patience did. of Job, doesn't yes, he? he does. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. To get this thing done. Especially for a lawyer. Right? <laughs> Charlie from Chicago wants to know, if my kid catches COVID at school and brings it home and someone in the family gets sick, can I sue the school for our medical bills? Wow. You are asking a really good question that I think is on the minds of a lot of people right now. This is an untested area. So I can't give you a yes or no. If the school acted recklessly 
and knew that people had COVID and didn't take the necessary precautions and there is no immunity that the school might have. You could have a case, but you're gonna to have to look at what is going on in your city, if it's a public school, if there's immunity, and what the school did if it constitutes negligence or recklessness. That will do it for this case. Let's go back into the courtroom. The litigants are right there. This is the plaintiff, Margareta Dobbs. She says she brought her car to the defendant's repair shop to get an oil change. And when she brought it home, she noticed oil in her driveway. She brought the car back and they charged her $142.05 for a diagnostic and told her she had multiple leaks and a loose wire connection. Well, why in the world didn't he tell her that when she had her oil changed? When she complained, the manager kicked her out and told her never to return. The defendants are as wrong as two left shoes. And she's suing them. These are the defendants, Ed Bressler and Adam Valentine. Adam says he would have been more than happy to fix any problems they may have caused to the plaintiff's car at their expense. But the plaintiff didn't like what she heard when they ran the diagnostic. She had a faulty connector to the starter and some oil leaks unrelated to an oil change. The woman went on a terrible rant against their poor cashier about having to pay for a diagnostic. And here they are. They're accused of being slippery. All parties, please take your right hands. Welcome back to the People's Court. Next case on the docket, the plaintiff says she brought her car into the defendant for an oil change. When she got it home, it was leaking in her driveway like crazy, so she wants a refund. But the defendant says the plaintiff's oil leaks have nothing to do with the oil change he performed. It's the case of being slippery. Thank you, Douglas. You're welcome, ma'am. Okay, Ms. Dobbs, you took your car in to Evans Chrysler in order to do what? I first took it there because I had a recall for the seat belt. And I said, since my recall, I might as well get my oil change. So I had my oil change and then uh, I bought my car home. All that was on May 27th? Correct. Okay. And then I went outside and I saw a leak in my driveway. And I'm going like. When did you go outside here? and see a leak in your driveway? Uh, it was like two days later. Okay. And I got on my knees and I crawled under the car. And so I said, this mm -hmm. is off a of thin. What is going on here? I took the, I called them first. And they told me, I told the car wouldn't start and I couldn't drive the car there. And so I had to get um, a tow truck. And so okay. they told me if I towed the car there and if they have to tow it into the bay, they will have to charge me for a diagnostic. And I told her, I'm not paying a diagnostic. And she said that, well, this is what we have to do. So she told me the car started. They pulled it into the bay. And then when they called me up on the phone, and they told me that I had multiple oil leaks and that um, I had a, a loose connector. Well, if I had multiple oil leaks when I took my car in, they have a um, paper that I sent you where they did the uh, vehicle uh, multi-point uh, inspections, and there would have been oil all underneath my chassis if there would have okay. been. Okay, hold on oil. one second and let me see that vehicle multi-point inspection. Okay, and I see that document. Under the vehicle, yeah, under the vehicle check checkup. Okay, so go on. See, I purchased that engine. It was a rebuilt engine, reconditioned, uh, built okay. engine. Okay, but I, with all due respect, I don't need to hear that. What I really okay. want to hear is from you folks at Evan Chrysler, Mr. Bressler and Mr. Valentine. Well, actually, the person I want to talk to is, uh, did either one of you do uh, the repair? No, neither one of us technician. Okay. It was one of our technicians. Nobody here is a technician. Everybody's brass. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So she brings it in. There's a seatbelt. Uh, recall that gets taken care of and she says I need an oil change and you guys do this multi-point under the carriage inspection um, and then within five days she has oil leaking she's mad that she had to bring it back to you because the things you're you're charging her for for diagnosing are things that she feels should have been spotted in the multi-point under carriage inspection what say you to that 
For clarity purposes, the multi-point inspection is just that. It's a visual inspection. It does not include any kind of diagnostics or um, it's, it's a recommendation sheet. When you do that, because you make it look real, you make it look glossy and pretty to us with little dots all over the place and mark. So what is that multi-point under the carriage inspection? You stick your head in between the concrete and the car. You don't put it up on a thing. No, it's while the vehicle is in the air. It's just a visual inspection. Oh, it is while the vehicle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's not an all-inclusive inspection, but as you, if you look at the document, you'll okay, see I want you to tell me the thing. difference between that and an and a uh, diagnostic. What's the difference? You're telling me, oh, there's a big difference. Tell me what the difference is. This particular diagnostic, first and foremost, would start with checking the battery to see if there's battery voltage. If you have battery voltage, then there's basically a diagnostic tree that's in the service manuals that they would follow. Now, unfortunately, I don't know every single step of that off the top of my head. More or less, uh, is that a visual or is that something you hook up to a machine or how do you no, check that's, that? You, you would actually have to hook up a machine to the vehicle to check the Got battery. Got Battery check. And, and What's then, the next thing you check in that diagnostic? Well, depending on, you know, what the findings were, which I'm sure in this case it would have been that the battery had a full charge on it. You would check to see if you're getting power out of the ignition switch to see if that is okay. sending basically a signal to the starter to, to tell the starter to engage, um, which it was. And then from there, he went to check the starter itself. And when he did that test, then that's when he found that the power feed wire going to the starter was corroded, and that was the issue with the intermittent no start. So that's when she was presented with an estimate to repair that connection, and she declined said repair. Okay, now her other complaint was, I saw oil underneath my car. So what was that about? Do you know from the diagnostic? We didn't do any further diagnostics. Just again, when the vehicle was up in the air, the technician just noted that it had multiple oil leaks. Um, the okay. next step in that. So her complaint is, if I have a bunch of oil leaks when you did an oil change, why did you not bring it to my attention and address it then? So my question to you is, when you look at this multi-point inspection sheet, what would be the answer to that? Well, if you look at the inspection sheet, there's nothing on there that is indicative to leaks. There's air filter, uh, fluid levels, and so on and so forth, but there's nothing on there that states that we're going to do a diagnostic, if you will, for any kind of a leak or anything like that. Is there a space on that multi-point inspection to note that there are leaks or no? Is there a dot for oil leaks no. that didn't get marked? No, there is not a dot for oil leaks. As you can, if you look at the document, right. and the oil leaks that your fellow them. saw, where were those oil leaks? Like, in other words, in the diagnostic that does happen on June fourth, he says, actually, you call what you did on June fourth a vehicle multi-point inspection, and uh, number two on the June fourth document says has several oil leaks, nothing to do with the oil change. Where were those oil leaks? Uh, that I don't know. The next step would have been is to put dye in the oil and run the engine to see where that dye was potentially coming out. That was presented to her, and you can see on that line, too, the very last thing was right. customer decline. But Jerry, who did the actual work, he would know where he saw the oil leaks, right, on June 4th. I mean, let's just say, for example, you have an oil leak at the top of the engine that's running down. Now, you could have a leak there as well as at the bottom of the engine that is masked by the oil coming from the top of the engine. I mean, the proper way to diagnose okay. an oil leak, again, would be to put dye in the oil, run the engine, and see where that dye is coming out of. Then you can properly okay. diagnose whether you have one or multiple leaks or so on and so forth. So tell me, when uh, the layperson hears it's an oil leak, they think it's coming from where you changed the oil. That is inaccurate. Right. Right. And then Am I correct? That that, point, then so it correct. can come, the oil leak can be manifesting itself in different places through the engine. Yeah, correct. Right. That was why we told her, yeah, you know, to let's get the vehicle in, and any towing and inspection or diagnostics would be up to her, but if it was related to the repairs we had performed, we would gladly absorb the towing and the cost of the inspection and repairs if it was in relationship to anything we had previously done. 
Okay, so now when they bring the car in, Ms. Dobbs, uh, they do tell you, listen, it's going to be 142 whatever unless we determine that it was our fault, right? No, they did not say that. Wait, when you brought it in on June 4th, what did you think was going to happen and how much did you think it was going to cost you? It wasn't going to cost me anything. They told me it would cost me if they had to tow my car into the bay. And so my car did not have to be towed into the bay. Do you have her authorization for the 142 something for the diagnostic no, and I writing? Did not. Yes. Okay, that's what I'm asking. Direct me to the original repair the, order. The, the very first document you're looking at, the one with the handwritten notes on it, that is that is the original invoice. That paperwork right there. If you okay. Stop right there. That's Hold on one original. second. I got it. I got it. I just found her signature. So I'm looking at this document, Ms. Dobbs, and is that not your signature on the bottom of the document? That the that is my signature, but that was after I had came back and they told me they wasn't. But I don't think that's truthful. Car. What you're saying right now cannot. Okay. You know, you're saying, oh, I signed that after they gave me the bill, except I'm looking at the document, and I have it up here, which happens after the bill, which is the document that has the tax and everything else. And what they say here is that you refuse to sign, which does sound consistent with someone being angry that they ended up having to pay it. The document no, I... that does have your signature, which is this one, I believe was something presented to you beforehand. There was a receptionist that, according to you guys, she was berating. Tell me about that. Where's that receptionist? Is she there today? No, she's off today. No. Okay, so go on. Tell me what, do either, did either one of you hear what happened? Were you present for it or no? Yes, I, we, well, the way it's set up is we had glass off no. so I could hear what was going on. Long story short, when she went in and the cashier asked her to pay the bill, she didn't want to pay the bill. Um, no. So that's when I went in there and I told her, look, the only way we're going to release the vehicle is if you pay the bill. And she was just very loud. And um, and it was not our cashier's fault. Our cashier was just a, no. a cashier. And how did that end up? I went into the cashier's office and asked her if she could please tone it down and just pay the invoice and she could remove her car from the property at that point. Okay. And Ms. Dobbs, you tell me your version of how that went down. Okay, uh, when he came in, the cashier said she's not uh, talking at me or being mean at me or anything. And then he told me to get off of the property and never come back there again. And I told him, I have a voice that carries. And I told him, I have a job that I have. <laughs> I, know, I know your pain. Yeah, I know so, your pain. <laughs> so, and then, you know, she said she's not bothering me. If that's why he's making sure she's not there. Okay. And if the cashier All was right. there, so and if she felt she wasn't going to lose her job, she would tell you that. <laughs> okay. I'm going I'm to tell you that I believe you on that, only because you're trying so hard to get me to believe you that it sounds like it matters to you if people think you're polite. But one of the things, and I just wanted to follow up and ask you, you had said in your complaint was, I would never berate someone because I am a woman of the cloth. How are you a woman of the cloth? I'm an ordained elder in the AMEZ church. And I have been ordained Lovely. for years. Okay. What I think happened, um, and, and this is what typically happens, is that they tell you if it's our fault, you won't have to pay, and then they conclude it's not their fault, and then maybe you're not happy about that. But from what I'm looking at in all of this paperwork, it is very different to do a diagnostic than to do that undercarriage inspection. They're not hooking it up to machines. They're not looking at just a visual in the undercarriage inspection that happens May 27th when all you've asked is, hey, there's nothing wrong with my car, just change my oil. But it's very different when they're looking for what is the cause of the problem. And you said something in your complaint, which is, that's not true because I took it to a different mechanic and there's nothing wrong with my car. Can you show me something from a different mechanic that says there's nothing wrong with your car? No, I took it to a mechanic and he told me there is and right Do now, you have that in started, writing? I cannot no, go I, by I what went back you, and, I should have went back and got it from him. But what I want to okay. tell you about that document is that the the advisor, she told me there uh, the only way they would charge me if they had to pull my car into the bay if it would not start. And they did not have to pull my car into the bay. The car started and it drove itself in there. They I'm sorry, you the got car. it. 
Hold on. Who told you that, that the car started? The, uh, this girl named Michelle, which is okay. the advisor. Let's that assume that that's here. true. If the car started, did you want them to just call you and say, come pick up your car, it started, and hang up? Or did you want them to inspect your car? That's what this charge is for, and I'm finding uh, in favor of the defendants. That's uh, my verdict. So the plaintiff does not prevail in this case. Ms. Dobbs, let me ask you, what do you think about what the judge has just had to say? You lost the case. I, I think the judge was wrong because uh, Evans and Rena Dodge is telling a lie, and that is not what happened. And if they had their people there, and if I had an oil leak, there should have been oil underneath my carriage that should have shown the oil, and you heard him say that he did not check to see why my oil was leaking. And that was the whole thing. The reason the car went back there is to check and tell me where this oil leak was supposed to be at. And I think the judge was wrong, point blank. All right, so the plaintiff loses. Let's talk to the defendants now, Mr. Bressler and Valentine. Number one, have you ever told people before never to come back, get off of the property and never come back again? Do you, you don't have to do that very often, do you? No, we don't have to do that very often. It just depends on the uh, the remainder of the customer. And, you know, we have other customers here, and we're just trying to make sure that everybody has a pleasant experience. Well, look, you, it looked like you bent over backwards to help her out. So in any event, congratulations. Uh, you know, you prevail in the lawsuit. You don't have to pay that money. And that'll do it. Now it's time for another session of After the Verdict. Well, modern cars are really not like the old cars way back when, where if you could turn a wrench, maybe you could change your own oil and diagnose some things at home. Didn't you uh, just try changing a battery? Actually, you did. You changed a battery in our car. I changed I, the battery, yes. I kept yelling at you. You're a judge. That. You're not a mechanic. Get out of there. Right. <laughs> but I probably saved a few bucks. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, we put a lot of faith in our mechanics. Uh, they have the, the computer diagnostic machines to plug in like this. And it seemed like as you were sorting through this case, it occurred to you that a loose wire like that can be an intermittent problem with starting. One day it'll start, the next day it won't start until you get it squared away. Right, right? That, which is actually kind of consistent with what they diagnose, which is you need a new starter because the connection's loose or whatever. Right, and the reality is a, a shop like this, whether it's Chrysler or whether it's a small oil change place, they're not really making money just changing oil, but they try to diagnose other things, they give you the inspection, they look it over, and if they see other things, they end up making money maybe on those things. But really, at, on an evidentiary basis, this case came down to she didn't have expert testimony to say that they did follow up, that there was something, right. something was, a, was a miss that they missed or they did something right. unnecessary. If she, had had, if she really had taken it to a, a, another mechanic, she should have had a report by him saying, right. there's nothing wrong with the starter, there's nothing right. wrong with this, and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. I would find that hard to believe because her car didn't start and she had to get it towed. Right. So Seems uh, like they really didn't do anything wrong. I don't think they did. It took me a while to understand that the oil would leak elsewhere. Like I was just thinking that there's one place where oil is, could but then leak from a head gasket. I, of course, because the oil is traveling through the the, the engine, right. and you know. Right. So yeah. So I know it's annoying, and people end up having big bills that they can't afford or don't want to have to pay. But uh -huh. uh, I did you believe also that that document was something that she signed beforehand? I believe she did. Yeah. And that's the conclusion you made as well. Yeah. Hey, we have a love-hate relationship with our mechanics, just right. like so many other people. When they have the knowledge and we really don't, it's like... It's you're, a, you're at their mercy. You've got a lot of Our faith doctors and, trust. and our mechanics. Exactly. My lawn looks horrible, and I know it's because my landscaper is slacking off. Can I use pictures of my lawn as evidence in court to not pay him for his bad services? Well... Uh, you can definitely bring pictures in if the lawn is brown and if the grass isn't growing and green. The issue is you got to prove that the landscaper did something wrong. And if you can't prove that, you're going to lose the case. So you may want to get another landscaper to look at it to see if something is amiss. You probably need some kind of an expert for this because sometimes lawns just don't grow. <laughs>